Welcome to Business Coaching Secrets with Carl Bryan. If you want to attract new high-end coaching clients, fill live events, and build a wildly profitable coaching practice where business owners pay, stay, and refer, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, Carl provides his keys to the kingdom for finding and signing high-paying clients and building the coaching business of your dreams. Here we go. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to another episode of Business Coaching Secrets. Your boy Road Dog here for yet another week with the only man that I know that lost a BMX race to a guy with one leg. And the guy whose dad is a professional gambler that he learned absolutely nothing from. <laughs> those road dogs, those unfortunately are both true and true stories. I lost them. We talked about that one time. I wasn't expecting that. I lost a BMX race to a guy with one leg. Oh, my dad hang, was he hang shit on me. Oh, my God. Listen, anyway. <laughs> Here's the deal. We're going to do a Zoom call with your dad the next time before we go into a poker setting because that was embarrassing. <laughs> I never play cards with this man. He is all in, firsthand. Every time. <laughs> sure I went another time. I came third. And there was only three because, you know, BMX, like, there's only three people in the race. I came third. And they called me up to get the trophy, right? My dad's like, how do you feel about that? And, oh man, I'm like, Dad, I'm, I'm ten. Leave me alone. My dad was a. He said we got to interview him sometime. He is a Thank funny you. son of a gun, Thank man. You. I love him. Got to get you anyway. on the podcast. All right. Um, listen, last week we uh, we were sort. I, I sort of queued it up that there was a, a question that I know you're going to go into great detail, and I wanted to make sure that we had the proper amount of time allocated. So we're going to start with that one today, if that's okay with everybody, because um, that, so, but I, that I just want to start with that because it's, I just think it's such a, it's a great question. Um, so with all that being said, now that I've postured the heck out of this whole thing, this yeah, question, like I'm, I'm nervous, road dog. What are you like, going to yeah. say? What are you going to ask me, man? It's going to be like marriage advice or what's happening? Let's go. Well, oh my God. Um, we're going to take a hard pass on relationship <laughs> and dating advice from the man who keeps talking about people being on sale. Um, you know, we'll keep that one at a, at a minimum right now. But we were talking about, because I know you've done a lot of, probably over the past, what, 24 months? Or is it only like, I don't know, whatever, on just accounting, right? You, you've done a lot of studying oh, yeah. on that. And somebody asked, yep. you explain operating cash flow and how it pertains to a growing business. So I thought, man, this, this is something that you've been doing a ton of research and homework on. So I'll just let you fire away at this and uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say. There we go. Actually, I co-wrote a book on accounting 101 for business coaches. So there you go. Yeah. So um, can I explain operating cash flow, um, how it pertains? Was it Road Dog? How it pertains to a growing business? Yeah. How it pertains to a growing business. Nail it, shoots. Wait a listen. Yeah. Okay. So three types. Look, there's three types of cash flow. There's finance cash flow, investment cash flow, operating cash flow. Um, so think, okay, so one, think your cars, your real estate, your equipment. Okay. So that's one type of cash flow, right? One is for raising money or say as the business owner, right? Like a shareholder loan, you're going to lend money to your own company or your client is lending money to its own company, uh, foster growth and that sort of thing or finance growth. Um, that's one, but operating cash flow. So think of operating cash flow as cash gen generated um, from general operations of a business, right? So operating cash flow is the Mac daddy of a growing business, absolutely, positively, without question. I uh, just think general day-to-day -day operations of the business, like they must create steady cash flow. And the more predictable, really, the better the business, the, the higher valuation or you went to sell it, you know, the quicker 
uh, basically you'd be able to sell it, right? And businesses go out of business for one reason only. The same way, if you ever played Monopoly, you go out of Monopoly for one reason and you also get kicked out of the business game um, for the same reason. That's when you run out of cash, right? So businesses go out of business for running out of cash. They don't run out of ideas. They don't run out of plans. They don't run out of, you know, their to-do list doesn't end. They don't have long-term potential or no long-term potential all of a sudden. It's like, here's a scenario, right? You got a business. um, They had a record year. The owner and everyone thinks that they're doing great. Uh, The accountant's your average accountant that doesn't, you know, correspond and communicate with the clients throughout the year and doesn't explain what we're going over here, right? So, you know, earlier in the year, what they do? They sold two trucks and a little bit of equipment, okay? It's stuff they no longer needed. They let it go. Let's assume that brought in $100,000 of um, total cash, right? So they sold two trucks. They sold some equipment. They got a hundred grand. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a lot of money, but whatever. Let's stick with a hundred grand. Um, that's not operating cash flow, right? So they didn't earn the money through day-to-day operations of the business, but it appears on the books that they made a hundred thousand dollars, right? Which they did. It's just it's not duplicatable, right? So, you know, like they can, you know, like they can't sell two trucks and the equipment next year. Because those two trucks and equipment, like they're gone, right? The money's in the bank, but then it's game over from there. So, so at the end of the year, they're going to do their taxes. Uh, they're going to congratulate themselves. They're going to hug their wife. Their w- wife's going to hug them. The accountant's going to hug both of them. It looks like they had this record year and everybody's doing great, right? Maybe they are, maybe they're not, right? But that, that $100,000 needs to be recorded and it needs to be recognized as something different than operating cash flow, right? Like, again, making money from day to day operations of the business, because that's not what happens. So, like, and what about that's a hundred grand? Let's amp that up and say we sold a piece of real estate for 500 grand, right? Like, imagine the difference that the financials look like year over year when in one year you have a $500,000 lump sum. Uh, from this real estate that was sold, right? So the company could be losing money from the normal course of business, but look insanely profitable. It's an illusion, big time, right? So, um, you know, I, look, it's going to look like they're super profitable. There could be cause for alarm. You don't know. They don't make any changes. And then next year, they're in for a big surprise. And let's call it a big red surprise, right? Because red ink on your financials is something that you don't want. Um, so if nobody's paying attention, and that's often the case, you know, there could be some real damage. And by the way, this business owners now all of a sudden they got these books and everybody's high fiving and hugging, including the accountants. They're flying first class. They're driving a hundred and fifty thousand dollar BMW all of a sudden. Or you know, it's like the example I've given many times where the Uber driver he thinks he's making a hundred thousand dollars, but he doesn't realize that he just ruined a sixty thousand dollar car in the process of doing so. Right? So he doesn't read financials. Not a great idea. Right? So like. Let me expand upon that, maybe a framework. Like if you were to ask me, okay, give me, um, what do I call it? Like three rules, like give me rules around operating cash flow um, or create a framework around this. Uh, I'd say this, look, rule number one, um, a business must, you know, have positive operating cash flow, the end, right? So you, you, if you can't generate cash flow through the general operations of your business, you've got to close up shop and do something else, the end, right? And if it doesn't, like, like a, a company would have to be paying its, because if you didn't, you got to look at the other side of it. The company would have to be, you know, paying its bills by selling assets. Like an example that I gave you a second ago, like dipping into savings, raising money um, through a second, through a, a third party, or like, again, a second ago, you're selling the trucks, you're selling the assets, you're selling the real estate of a business, or you're going to a bank, you're going to an investor, um, and potentially giving up equity. Like the biggest unadvertised issue with raising money um, by giving it up equity is that you're suddenly answerable to someone else, right? So if you own 100% of the, the company, and now suddenly you own 80 and somebody else owns 20, um, like compliance comes into it. And Compliance takes time. It takes effort. It takes, um, you know, money. It takes your focus away, which is the most important thing, right? And by the way, sometimes that's a good thing, right? Especially if it's some um, smart money, right? But if it's not smart money, and it's often not, 
that can be a handbrake on growth and future success. And what do I mean by smart money? Like Mark Cuban on Shark Tank is smart money because he's going to, you know, he's handing you his 250 grand. But if you ask him, he's got a vested interest in your success. You ask him a question, he's going to really give you it. He's going to give you a good answer. Um, another part of that that doesn't necessarily uh, fall into what I'll call the definition of smart money, but Mark Cuban's also not going to be staring down, um, you know, the gun at you to say, look, you know, you really got to, you know, per- you need, I need a profit and I need a return that 250 grand, you've had it for 12 months. When do I start seeing my profit? Right. Like that's not something that he's going to do. So again, this is a much better investor than somebody that's all of a sudden saying, you know, I gave you 250 grand. Where's, where's my cash, right? Like where's my, where's my piece of the, the puddle? Where, where's the profit and where's my cut? Right. So, so some, and sometimes during like, let's say a heavy growth spurt, a healthy business can have a short term negative operating cash flow, right? Like they buy inventory or let's say that they get new equipment, they need new, you know, vehicles, maybe it's a, a piece of real estate, whatever it might be. Um, you know, like, like, so they do that, but if a large account receipt, like if they have a large accounts receivable balance, right. Where they expect to get paid on work for like from 30, 60, maybe 90 days, which is getting a bit nerve wracking. Well, this could be bad. So you understand how that would create, um, short term negative operating cash flow because you just took on a bunch of work. You fulfilled it. You said, guys, pay me in 30 to 60 days. You see how that could create a little bit of a gap between you doing the work, paying everybody, paying your suppliers, and then you realizing your cash, right? Like getting paid on that work. Uh, but it, it just, it has to be the exception and not the rule, you know? So it's something that should be short-lived. Um, and, and the business owner needs that it's going on. And they'd be watching things, again, accounts receivable, very, very important, under um, understood. I don't think the average business coach really, when they think of their job as a uh, as a business coach, I don't think they're really looking at accounts receivable as something that they should be coaching people on and worrying about. But that's a mistake, right? You've really your client is growing. They need to be watching stuff like that because you've heard the expression that growth puts more people out of business than lack of growth, or again, a different variation of that. Well, I just explained exactly why that happens, okay? Because they don't collect their money. They pay everybody. They don't get paid. They run out of cash. You fold up a Monopoly game. Everybody, you know, you have to go home while everybody else continues to play, right? So, or I often talk about having a hole in the boat and then going further out in the lake um, to fix it. Again, if you have an accounts receivable problem and then you're growing your business madly, you have an accounts receivable problem that will create a cash flow problem. You grow your business quickly to try fix your cash flow problem to find out that, oh my gosh, hang on, I'm not collecting this money either. And you just end up with a significantly bigger hole, but you're further out in the lake. What do you think of that one? Right? So, so anyway, so this, you know, this short term shortfall, you know, like it can be managed and how can you manage it through accounts payable? And once again, um, you've got to be able to commute in order to get some leeway with your suppliers on something like accounts payable. Like suddenly you're not going to be paying all your bills up front. You might get to 30 days and say, look, I need this extended to 60. You might get to 60 and need to extend it to 90. But I got to tell you, if you want that to be able to happen, you're going to have to do something called communicate where most people take their head, plunk it in the sand. Um, and that's not a good idea, but this can be a superpower for a growing business where you've got the ability to negotiate, right, with your suppliers to get some leeway to get this stuff dragged out for 90 days, that can that can be incredible. How many business coaches do you know that talk to a coaching client and say, so let's talk about your accounts payable, right? This is very unsexy, very undelusional kind of stuff. You know, this isn't the four hour work week. This isn't, you know, funnels. This isn't the high ticket sales, the, you know, the, the secret, that sort of stuff. Um, but I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's important. I've, again, I've said this on different podcasts in the, in the past. When you buy something from Apple, they don't pay you for 91 days. They're the most cash flush, most profitable business on the planet. Why wouldn't they just pay everybody up front? They've got all this money. Well, 
you know, their argument is that it takes them 91 days to get paid for the iPhone. So they don't pay people for 91 days. And if you want to do business with them, this is the way they do it. If you wonder why I don't understand, I just explained it like this, their money. How would you like to get a, how would you like to go to the bank, get a hundred thousand dollars, keep it for 89 days and then give it back on day 90 and not have to pay a dollar of interest. Just give them back their money. Okay. That's what 90 day terms are with suppliers and 60 days and 30 days. It's free money, right? So, so anyway, so something to be thinking about, um, you know, this cash flow. it's a, it's a, it's an interesting animal, but I encourage you to explore it. But that would be rule number one is that you've got to have, you, you've got to have positive cash flow from day to day operations, right? Um, I'd say rule number two is that operating cash flow should be greater than profits, right? This can even, even accountants sometimes don't get, in fact, more than sometimes don't get this right. And basically you say, well, how could cash flow be greater than profits? That doesn't make any sense, right? Well, to the naked eye, it doesn't. Two little words, depreciation and amortization, right? They're literally magic. Um, secret sauce for minimizing a tax position um, for a, a profitable company. And just on a P&L, right, profit and loss statement or an income statement, same thing. Not all expenses are cash, okay? Depreciation is the expensing of a tangible item, like a car, equipment, real estate, over the life of the asset, right? And then amortization is the exact same thing, but we call it amortization for an intangible asset. So think intellectual property, um, think a patent, think goodwill. Um, again, so you amortize it, uh, you advertise it as an expense over the life of that asset, right? So listen to this, depreciation and amortization reduce earnings and profits without requiring cash. And then I want you to capitalize cash, bold it, italicize it. So imagine being able to, look, in other words, think of it this way, you pay taxes on profits, and depreciation and amortization decrease profits without costing you cash or money, right? So you and your coaching clients need to learn how to use these two. Um, and you will, and if you do, and by the way, if you're speaking to your accountant about this, you can dramatically reduce your tax position, right? And, and frankly, they're a superpower and there's many businesses, not only they're not using it correctly and to the point where we can call it um, a superpower, but they're not even using it at all, right? And it's, uh, you know, I translate that pay less tax by understanding two little words, depreciation and amortization. Um, and if you do that, you're going to have more cash to play with. And more to the point, you're going to have more cash to keep. Remember, you can get lucky and make it. You can't get lucky and keep it, right? It's not what you make. It's what you keep. You know, all those sorts of metaphors and, um, you know, sayings that are thrown around like crazy. This is where they come into it, right? But folks don't normally what people will tell me at this point as we start talking about this stuff and I get it and I used to be there, you know, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not a numbers gal. I don't get the numbers. That's, I would encourage you to explore that in a very real and tangible way. Right. So, so bottom line, therefore your profits or maybe your coaching um, high end coaching clients profit should be smaller um, than operating cash flow. Right. It's the other way around your operating cash flow is smaller than your profit. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to check, your balance sheet for rising accounts receivable, inventory balances that are increasing, and then look for decreases in accounts payable, just talked about that, right? Or other liabilities like loans getting paid off, right? If, if profits are good, but operating cash is hurting, the issue with 100% is gonna be found on your balance sheet, okay? So more specifically, rising assets, um, like accounts receivable, inventory, equipment, or decreasing liabilities like accounts payable, taxes payable, loans payable, et cetera. Okay. So that's rule number two. And then I go rule number three, and I want to encourage you to manage your psychology right now. We're talking about accounting and small business finance and a lot of stuff for the average business coach. They're really, um, you know, not that excited about, but this is a topic that if, if Warren Buffett were speaking to us right now, he'd go, you should be listening to this at like 30 times the intensity that you do to, again, the Facebook ads and the sexy delusional four-hour work week and, you know, systems will set you free. 
yada, 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 right? Sty systems don't set you free. Systems stifle creativity. Topic for another day, but you get the idea. If Warren Buffett was here, he would be in role. <laughs> Give myself a compliment here, Road Dog, that uh, I'm sure that Warren Buffett would be incredibly impressed if he was sitting here listening to this. But anyway, so <laughs> rule number three, uh, what would I say? So operating cash flow should move in the same direction as profits, as in up or down, right? So ideally, um, due to depreciation and amortization, operating cash flow um, will move at a higher percentage rate um, than profits and increasing, right? So a business that makes, look, a business that makes less and less cash on more and more expenses will eventually go broke, right? Let me say this again. A business that makes less and less cash on more and more expenses will eventually go broke. In other words, a business that has profits that are going up and operating cash flow going down means they're becoming less and less productive at converting profits into operating cash flow, right? So an example is you get a growing business that's making lots of sales, but again, they're not collecting the money. In other words, accounts receivable is growing, going up, right? But they appear to be doing great and everyone's super busy. The phone is ringing. It feels like the company's growing. There's a lot of energy. What could possibly be going wrong, right? Like their balance sheet looks amazing. Um, you know, but because they and they think that they're about to collect all this money. Accounts receivable lives on the asset side of a balance sheet, but this is you know the builder that you know the builder that owes you all this money goes out of business, right? Or for whatever reason, just the person that owes you the money, they can't pay it. They stretch it out, stretch it out. You think they're a great guy, they're a great gal, they're going to pay it. Um, they don't. This is what spells, you know, big trouble for growing businesses, right? Again, businesses fall over, um, you know, as much for growth as they do lack of growth or lack of sales, right? Too many sales versus lack of sales. So, so anyways, business owners, Road Dog, just are not thinking like this. And if I were to sum it up, you know, I get that numbers, they're not sexy. They're not sexy in any way. Uh, but understanding these very basic principles can change the game in a very real and meaningful way. Certainly have for me, you know what, experiment it. But in a perfect world, um, a business, look, okay, in a business, in a perfect world, a business would be able to grow using operating cash flow, right? So that's what I'd refer to as the definition of a healthy business. Like it, it doesn't, so what do I mean by that? Like it doesn't need to call in investors. You don't need to borrow the money from the business owner or from outside um, entities like, you know, banks or selling off assets like I described earlier, right? You know, the equipment or the real estate or whatever I was talking about earlier, like you don't need to do that, right? It's like the business literally grows strictly off uh, the cash flow generated from the general operation of the business, right? Um, so great question, uh, complex topic, but insanely powerful. And just the moral of the story, stop building cute websites and being impressed by, you know, sexy funnels, although they absolutely have a place to be clear. Uh, but I would highly encourage you to manage your psychology and, you know, learn to read financial statements. And I And I think that you'd be, in the end, further ahead. And I think your coaching clients would be further ahead. So that's what I got for you, Road Dog. Sexy and confusing. I thought you were talking about me. That was, uh, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, hey, uh, so here's a, here's a good one. Um, this is, oh my God. I, I swear we talk a lot of psychology on the show. But so here's a question I came up. How do you help coaching clients, quote, think for themselves? I find some of my clients try to give me a job. Like this is Whoa. such a good question, right? So how, how do you handle that? <laughs> yeah. Um, help coaching clients think for themselves. You know, it's funny. Your, your brain's given to you at birth, right? And things that are free and uh, given to you tend to be a little bit underappreciated. Um, I think we give our brains like little jobs rather than big jobs. You know, think like Elon Musk versus the average restaurant owner think of the difference between what they're thinking right or like think of your brain as a garden like you plant a seed um and the one thing you got to plant that seed it's got to be exactly what you want but think of the kobe bryant example i give all the time 
Um, he knew exactly what he, what he wanted. So therefore he got it. He wanted to be the best in the world. That was the, the seed that he planted at the age of 15 and he didn't change it. He didn't deviate, didn't say second, third, fourth will be good enough. A couple of championships. I want to retire. I want to be rich. He didn't change his focus that the seed just continued to grow and grow and grow. And in his opinion, he became the best basketball player of all time, right? Like that, that was his opinion. He didn't want to be the best basketball player in the world, you know, in Michael Jordan's eyes or Shaquille O'Neal's eyes or Phil Jackson's eyes. He wanted to be the best in the world in his eyes. And his opinion is that that's what he, uh, that's what he accomplished. So that single minded focusness, uh, is absolutely critical. And if you really think about it, if you do this properly, I uh, will say Kobe Bryant, the late great, um, not only will you accomplish your goal, but it's like borderline impossible not to, right? Like, like there are laws of nature um, that they just, they work and they can't not work, right? Like gravity, you jump off a pail. We talked about this not long ago, I think, but you jump off a pail and you're going to go down. That's it, right? And if you jump off a roof, let's say that it's 10 feet tall, what's going to, that same gravity is going to work, but you're also going to end up with velocity, right? So guess what? You end up, you know, it's significantly greater when you got the two forces working um, in concert, right? So the equivalent to that is setting a big goal. Remember using your brain for uh, big tasks, not little tasks is, you know, the secret pill. So, you know, and it must be something much bigger than yourself. So the coach, the old metaphor, you know, the the coach that's trying to make 10 grand a month is like jumping off a pail, right? But, you know, trying to make enough money for your church, your charity, you know, feeding a thousand and 10,000 and a hundred thousand um, hungry local kids or saving marriages, stopping local separations, which are rampant in the business world, especially now as we live through a pandemic, um, you know, depression, suicides, like focus on that um, and, you know, and see yourself as already achieving that big goal. Right, right. Like reality is your sum. Like you are the sum total of your thoughts to this point, right? Like, like I was skiing, right, not long ago. There's this huge truck, right, and it's like moving snow, and it's like, and I mean, this thing was huge. This is a little guy driving this huge truck, right? Look like this little head popping out. You can hardly see the guy, um, and it, it's operating this huge mas- machine. Like the efficiency. And the amount of work that he was able to do and the amount of snow that he was able to move and, and again, the way that he, the manner in which he was able to do it, he was mind boggling. I just sat there and watched this guy for, you know, an hour or more, right? Like, I want you to think of that as you and your brain, right? But your brain is the big machine and you're that little head popping out. Like if you were driving that monster machine, imagine if the guy just let go of the steering wheel, let it drive itself. I mean, this, this thing would be bulldozing, you know, houses and making a huge mess, right? Well, would you do that? Or would you grab the wheel if you had a machine that powerful to be able to double its potential and its ability, much like velocity and gravity work in concert, right? So, so that's you directing your thoughts. So rather than you know, your brain directing yours, you're directing it, right? Remember, your brain is not designed to make you happy. It's not designed to make you successful. Your one million year old brain is designed to keep you safe. So therefore, your brain is constantly looking out for what is wrong. So if undirected, that's all you're going to see is things that may go wrong. And you know, if you don't use your brain, your brain uses you. Look at it in that manner. Again, like that machine bulldozing, you know, buildings and whatnot, it wouldn't stop, right? If the foot's on the gas, it's going to be moving. So how do you do that? Read every day, learn every day, improve every day, be grateful every day, be grateful to like the little things, the fresh air um, that you and your family are able to breathe, the fresh water, um, you know, the fresh water that runs out of your tap. Uh, your heart beating a million times a day or whatever it is without you having to do anything, you know, like, so set a clear goal and with single minded focus, um, you get towards it. So I don't, so that's, you know, your, your clients, you got to empower them to basically be able to do that, right? Like you got to, everything I just described, you know, Kobe Bryant planting a seed. I don't need to meet the coaching client to know that he's kind of, you know, he's running over buildings and he's got his hands off the, or him or her have their hands off the, uh, the steering wheel. You know what I mean? So Ro- I don't know, Road Dog. That's, that's what I'd say. What do you think? Love it. Love it. Um, 
Just to follow up on that though, like, can you give us an example of a great goal for a business coach looking to make a hundred K? A great goal for, um, yeah, I, I just said it, it, you know, it, it needs to be bigger than that. Like that's the trap, right? So that's the, what you did, like the coach trying to make a hundred grand. The problem is that's the seed that he's planting or she's planting, right? So, you know, here, here's a goal. Set a goal to have one business presentation with 10 people in the room every single week at the local chamber of commerce, right? And you're going to educate those people to the point where they're going to leave the room and like they're going to have a totally dis- different, totally better grasp, we'll call it, on how to build their business, market their company, whatever, right? Some will buy, some won't, doesn't matter. You're going to be looking after the pie. There's, there's some depressed business owners. There's some separations. There's some divorces. Those are the people in your audience, right? There's a suicide in there. And if you can help them turn that business around, you literally save a life. I truly believe as business coaches, we save lives. We're like paramedics, right? And I really, you know my story. I've talked about it lots of times. I'll talk about it lots in the future. My big brother committed suicide over a business failing. And then my mother drank herself to death and I had a front row seat for the whole thing, right? So, so just setting, you know, that one goal, you know, like agree to call. And by the way, if you're going to do that, okay, we talked about this a little bit on the pre-show road dog, right? Like agree to cold call every single one of these guys, right? Yes. Over time, you're going to learn new techniques and the referrals are going to start to flow and the JVs are going to flow. Again, I got a program called live event mastery. If you just follow it to a T, I promise you it would do all of that for you. But let's, let's just, again, dial in and set your goal so that the worst case scenario for 12 months, you are going to cold call. And what you are going to do is you are going to put 10 people in a room every single week at the Chamber of Commerce, and you're going to educate those people like they've never been educated before. And imagine after you do 52 of those presentations, how amazing you're going to be at the end, like on the 52nd versus the first, right? Like there's an example of something that I think, you know, a business coach could really cling on to and absolutely crush it. You know, your level of success as a business coach will be in direct proportion to the level of success others have through you, right? Like life doesn't give large trophies for small efforts. And forget trophies. We, you know, most people don't even have a scoreboard right? Like when you don't have a scoreboard, you don't know if you're winning or losing. More importantly, you don't know if you're about to win or if you're about to lose. And if you just keep going or you should change trajectory, change your game plan, right? Like, like when you're playing hockey and you're dominating the play and the shots on goal and the scoring chances, right? Which you fundamentally see most, a lot of that will be reflected on the scoreboard. The coach will say to you, let's just stay with it. And the luck is going to turn our way right? The ones that aren't going in and the posts that we're hitting, they're about to start, you know, they're about to go in. And back in hockey, we refer to it as the hockey gods. You hear that, it's, you know, that's very common. We talk about the hockey gods. They're going to look after us, right? So it's amazing how consistent they are um, over the long haul. But in short little bursts, it, it can be the difference, right? So the shots on goal are part of the scoreboard, right? And when they're being tracked, um, it's easy to know what's going on. If they're not being tracked, it's hard to know what's going on. And you might change course when you were on the right course, if you know what I mean, right? So like a business coaching scoreboard, what would that look like? The number of leads, the number of JVs, uh, the number of prospects you have to follow up with, the number of appointments you've got this week, the number of speaking engagements, the number of attendees you have for those speaking engagements, right? So the same way that total yards and turnovers help a, a football team, um, and the number of hits and runners in scoring position, I guess, like for a baseball, uh, you know, baseball game or a baseball team or for the coach, the data and numbers on that scoreboard will tell you if you're about to win or lose, right? If you need to, you know, keep going or if you need to totally change the approach, like Bill Belichick is most famous for at halftime, the changes that he would make at halftime. You, you look at the Patriots over the last decade and a half. And in the second half, this is when they really won the game. If you look at the Super Bowls that they won, at halftime, the adjustments that he made, he left, he left the other coaches for dead, right? So, and, and what is winning or losing? I started with that. You got to set your goal, right? Like if you don't set the goal, you don't know if you're on your way to winning or losing. And if you don't have a scoreboard, you need a scoreboard and, and the goal. You know, I, like my alarm goes off four times a day, every day, 8, 10, noon, and 2 o'clock. I call it quarter time. 
right? And it's, you know, I'm far from perfect, right? But I got to tell you, so often it whips me, you know, from beta into alpha mode so I can grab the steering wheel of my day, right? So, you know, so many business coaches, when you talk about goals and, you know, it's, it's, in, it's that story inside their head. Like, again, somebody's overweight. They're like, why can I never lose weight? It's because the story inside their head, it, no strategy can overcome the story in your head, right? Or no smoker can overcome, you know, no patch and no chewing gum, the story in your head that you're a smoker or the story in your head that you're overweight. You've got to overcome that. So like business coaches will say, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too inexperienced, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough contacts, you know, or they go to the, you know, the outside, you know, the gas prices or the pandemic, the government in charge, uh, you know, the real estate market, whatever it be. It's, it's not the pandemic, it's you. It's your choices, your decisions, your activity, or lack thereof, by the way, right? So if the promise is clear, uh, the price is easy, right? So um, I, I can just picture someone listening to this and thinking, you know, you're right. I'm lost. I'm going nowhere. And, and they fall into like a paralyzed state, right? The magic pill, the secret sauce, um, small, small trajectory adjustments make monumental shifts. Um, example, think of a plane going from LA to New York, right? Pilot's not paying attention. And as he leaves LA, the, you know, the, the plane is off by just like a very moderate, just like two degrees, right? They end up in Iceland, right? You end up in New York, you end up like in a whole different freaking country, like not even close, right? So like, like the wealth hack of that, I would say, it's not the percentage that matters, it's the discipline of doing it, right? So let's say investing, everybody knows that they should invest, road dog knows, I know, you know, your clients know, you'd have to be an idiot not to know that investing is a good idea, right? So it's not the amount, it's not the percentage, it's the philosophy, right? So if you didn't invest 10% when you made 75 grand a year, you're not magically going to start investing 10% when you hit a million, right? You, you got to make that 2% adjustment now. What is that 2% adjustment? While, you're, while the person that I just described, like at 75 grand, you got that make that adjustment there, right? Otherwise, you, you end up, well, if you do make that 2% adjustment now, what's going to end up, you're going to end up in Iceland financially, but in a good way, right? Like in that, let's assume Iceland, it's more north, right? So north is up and that's, you know, more money. Um, that slight adjustment can be absolutely magic. So, so there you go, road dog. That's what I got, man. That's the, um, you know, little small adjustments. But I, I think again, you're like, what's a good goal? For every individual coach, they can do whatever they, you know what I mean? Like there's a whole number of them, but rather than trying to make 10 grand a month, which I'm telling you here and now is a horrific goal, it is not going to get you to where you ultimately want to be. Um, still, you know, putting 10 people at the Chamber of Commerce in a room every single week. Now that is a worthy goal and you're not going to put them there so you can make lots of money and you can crack six figures and you can hit 500 grand and you can buy a BMW and a Ferrari or take your, you know, none of that. The reason you're going to do it is that local business owners don't know how to grow their business. Again, they're worried about cute websites and not able to read financial statements as an example. They wouldn't know what operating cash flow was if it punched them in the head. Um, that's the reason I want you to run your event, right? Like, it's like losing weight. If somebody wanted to lose weight, they could spend seven minutes on the internet and have a 100% bulletproof strategy roadmap, um, you know, for doing so. Uh, but, you know, but will they, you know, like it's right there. Like, in other words, the strategy to lose weight is get off your fat ass, go for a walk and start, stop eating so much and leave the potato chips in the cupboard, right? Like there's your roadmap for losing weight, but people make it so complicated. They use their brain for little things instead of big things, right? And they overcomplicate it big time um, and they make it challenging. What am I getting at? To grow a business is not that hard, right? Like, but you've got to understand the fundamentals. When you understand the fundamentals, um, you know, you spend your time, your energy, your resources there. You simplify versus complicate. When given, when again, when 
when somebody takes their hands, you know that metaphor I gave earlier with the, you know, the truck at the, 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 the ski hill, right? It's a massive machine with a little head. When you let go of the, the wheel, what happens is your brain complicates things times 10. That's your business owner, right? Like, I don't need to look at their to-do list to know that they're never getting through it in a million years. And the reality is that we looked at their to-do list, there would be, I, I dare say 80% of it is just garbage, right? It's the little things. Again, they're using their brain for little things instead of using their brain for the big things, right? So, so it's the old um, adage. So that's the reason, Road Dog, that folks, like I said, when I say that that's a goal that I think is worthy, I think because if you, if you, you know, spoke to 10 people every single week for 52 weeks, the amount of people that would get your education and 10 people would leave and only three people would remember anything. Only three people would actually act, you know, two are going to buy and then, you know, three leave and actually are adjusted in some way, shape or form. Well, that's success times 10. Like that's, that's a, that's a worthy goal. You are going to put, you, you are going to impact three people every single week that are not going to um, operate their businesses in the, the same vein. So, so there you go, Road Dog. That's what I'd say, bud. What do you think? You like that goal? It, it, here's what I'm hearing, okay? Because it's, it's, it's interesting because I've never heard you explain it that way before. And, and here's what I'm sort of hearing, and this might actually resonate with some people. Rather than focusing on the dollar amount, you got to focus on the activity that's going to generate that dollar amount plus so much more in the future. It's sort of like, Never mind understanding the basics and the fundamentals, because you talk about you got to understand the fund, you got to do the fundamentals. Like by the simple act of just going and doing the event again and again and again, like if you have a target of 100K, you can, like anyone can do that. Like let's not kid ourselves. Yeah. But can you do it again and again and again? Right. And I think that's what you're trying to say. Build the muscle that allows you to continuously hit and exceed those targets because now you've built that, like you've conditioned yourself to do it. Does that sort yeah. of sound about right? I, 100%. It's like my daily email. Do you know what I mean? Like I just, I set my, it's funny, my dad, you know, he does the, you know, I read, you know, basically I call my dad every night and then I read him the email. And of course, he, oh my gosh, you're not going to say that, are you? Whatever, you know, we have this funny back and forth. But like, he just said, he's like, I don't know where and I've written every single word of that. I haven't outsourced any of it. I have written every single word. And at the end, my dad, you know, continue. He's like, man, you know, or, you know, your dad, he wants to look after, he wants to keep me safe. His, his job is to be my dad, right? Not his goal is not to help me grow my business. His, his goal is to keep his kid happy, right? And safe and yada, yada, yada. So he's like, a, I don't know where you come up with this stuff. And B, like, when are, are you going to stop this? Right. And I tell him all the time, like, dad, I'm just, I'm not stopping them. Like I, I will do this probably forever. Right. And he's like, you're crazy, man. You know what I mean? But he, but he gets it. And he's just like, like my commitment is that I'm just doing it. The end. Right. So, and how, and I'm a busy guy and believe me, there are days where I've forgotten to do it and I haven't gotten to and scramble, scramble, scramble. I mean, this not long ago, I actually talked about this, but I, I woke up at 4 a.m. I didn't have the email. I woke up at 4 a.m. And I punched that bad boy out, ready to go. And I'm sure somebody would have read it. They would have been like, oh, wow, that's a really good email. Um, you know, but that, that's just, it's the, it's the commitment to it. So yes, it's, it's the activity. And just the same way that you convince yourself that you're overweight or that, you know, your parents were overweight, so you're going to be overweight. Or the story that you've got is that, um, you know, you're a smoker, so you're always going to be a smoker and your parents were smokers and it's their fault, whatever it is. Like, you just got to change that story to, You've got unbridled discipline. Uh, you are painstakingly efficient and you are going to find a way. Because the problem that you might not realize on the surface is that if you're going to fill an event every week for 52 weeks, the challenge is going to be that you're going to get a lot of clients. You're going to become very, very busy and you're not going to have time to do these events in the future if you're not you know, ridiculously disciplined and ridiculously focused on the goal that you're looking to achieve, right? So, so that, that's where the chance, it's the same way that somebody wants to build a million dollar coaching practice, right? So if you want to build a seven figure coaching practice, grab a pen and a piece of paper and write this down, right? You've got um, the recruitment, you've got the conversion, and you got the fulfillment. Those three baskets, that's it. The recruitment, the conversion, 
and the uh, fulfillment. And when people think of a seven figure business, right? And again, that I'll talk to people all the time and they go, yeah, I want to do seven figures in my coaching. And then I I said that play dumb, right? Like, Hey, what's that per month? Nobody ever give me an answer, right? It's $83,333. 33 cents per month. If you want to hit a million bucks, you got to do 83 grand per month, right? Well, they hear that, they think about it, and they always think, number one, recruitment, 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 like as in lead generation, right? Well, if you want to build a seven-figure coaching company, like the generating the leads, I'm sorry, it's just not that hard. That would be a classic example of somebody overthinking and complicating times 10. It's really easy to do. The challenge, so you just, you build that system, you generate the leads, um, you convert the client, again, sell money at a discount, use my software, uh, you know, build a process to be able to convince people. It's very difficult to sit with a business owner and not convince them that they need some help, right? Like Tiger Woods has a golfing coach. I think this guy might be able to use a business coach, right? It's just 101. The one that stops somebody from getting seven figures and where I'm going with this is that the glass ceiling lives in number three, which is fulfillment. Once you've got, again, you get 20 clients at two grand a month, that's 480 grand a year, right? That wicked margins as a business coach, that's why we should, I think it's a wonderful reason to stay in it and really pursue it and excel in it. But like, so you do twice that, you're roughly at a million bucks, right? But it's the servicing of the 20 clients at two grand a month that stops you from going to 20 to 40. Whereas most people think it's the lead gen, lead gen, lead gen. Remember, your success will be in direct proportion to the amount of success that people have through you, right? So therefore, if you have 20 clients at two grand a month and they're all crushing it, you're going to get 20 referrals. You're going to get 20 recommendations. 20 people are going to hear about it and send you an email and say, hey, can you guide me too? Or I heard you you run these wicked presentations of the Chamber of Commerce I want to be there. I, I want to be at one of these things. That's what will happen, right? But so anyways, there's, there's three baskets there, the lead gen, the conversion, and then the fulfillment. It's the fulfillment that kills them, right? So therefore, if your goal was to run 52, um, most people will hear the goal of running 52 um, every week, running an event with 10 people in the room. And I think that their mind automatically goes to lead generation, like, holy cow, how will I find 10 people every single week? to show up and do one of these presentations. And the reality is that the lead gen is not going to be the challenge. It's going to be the, the showing up and the doing the events because you're going to become so busy with the joint ventures and the lead gen and the new coaching clients and the new work. That's what creates the gas ceiling. So, so anyways, road dog. So that's what I'd, um, yeah, that's the, you want to do seven figures or you that's a good goal for a business coach right there, you know, it, it, but it has to be bigger than them. Again, the goal of trying to make 10 grand a month, 120 grand a year, it's so incredibly lame. Um, it, it just will not, as soon as there's a bump, because your vision's not big enough. So there's a challenge. Somebody tells you to F off. There's this, there's that. Uh, on the pre-show, we talked to Dave McKenzie, right? Again, this month, he's going to do whatever, close to 50 grand a month. The guy's been cool. Like all he, he built his entire company. He's been a client for a long time, built his entire company off of just cold calling. But of course, that cold calling has now led to the referrals, the speaking engagements, the recommendations, the word of mouth, et cetera, right? Just built it up. But it's the dogmatic um, discipline of just, you know, continuing through, although you just get so busy, you can't keep up, right? Like my email, I just, I just commit to it. So I just find a way I got 900 clients in 24 countries. I'm a busy dude. I'm not looking for an extra email. I get, can't, you know what I mean? Like it's just, it just doesn't, but that's not, my story is not that if I don't get enough emails today and I don't have enough to do today, I'll get to my daily email, right? It's that the daily email is getting done and that's that. And by the way, it's not just writing the email. I got to come up with something clever every single time too, right? I don't think that that's not the real magic writing. I've, I've got it to a fine art and science now where I can punch these things out real quick. Once I've got my concept, once I've got my idea, the problem I've got, you know, a, you know, well and true 365 plus days into this, it's coming up with a new concept that I haven't already written about, right? So there's, there's a bit of work that goes into that. But the story in my head is that I'm doing it and I'm going to continue to do it. So my spidey senses when I'm, you know, I see I'm driving down the road and I see a sign. It gives me an idea. I'm speaking to a business coach. I'm speaking to a business owner. I'm speaking to my wife. I'm speaking to my kids. I'm speaking to my neighbor. 
I was speaking to Road Dog, come up with an idea. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll write about that. And you, you see, I open up my phone and I go to notes. I can show you. I, I once printed it off. I have like notes in my phone when I see an idea or I come up with something um, that I'm going to write about with an email. Um, I basically plunk it in my notes, and it's like it's it's I don't know a hundred pages long, like printed off and you know off of a printer. Like it's that long. It's that many ideas that I've come up with, and then I write about one and I x it off and I x it off. So, and I don't want to make this about me. Who gives a crap about me? This is about you. Um, you guys want to make, you know, you want to build that business coaching business of your dreams. We've got to set your, you got to set your goals so that they're significantly more exciting than making 10 grand a month, 120 grand a year. You can start there because maybe getting to 10 grand will allow you the freedom and the bandwidth and the mental clarity to do this other stuff that we're talking about, you know, the charity and the giving back and, worrying about separations and divorces and um, depression and suicides locally, right? To, to change your mindset. That's cool. But, but again, Elon, think of what Elon Musk is thinking about. And then the local restaurant owner, don't be the local restaurant owner. Think a lot bigger whilst keeping one eye on being tactical and the day to day um, one foot in front of the other. In other words, picking up the phone, sending out the messages, speaking to the business owners, speaking to the girls at the chamber and the accountants who whoever else are going to help you grow your business, making sure that there's an application um, to every, uh, you know, there's an application. There's not just a big picture, Elon Musk, I'm going to colonize Mars, right? Like don't let yourself go there in the fantasy land. Make sure that you, you combine that with one foot in front of the other one word out of your mouth at a time in terms of moving you towards that, that broader goal. And the one that I gave is one event at the chamber per week with 10 people. If you did that at the end of 52 weeks, you've got yourself a crushing business coaching company. You'd have to have coaches working for you to keep up with everything. Uh, you'd be doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and be making a huge difference. And I think that's what most of our listeners are looking for. So, so there you go, road dog, a little bit long winded, man, but, that's a worthy rabbit hole, in my opinion. I guess I got to take down my Elon Musk poster. Um, so the guy <laughs> who's got like Steve Jobs on his wall. I like, anyways. Um, <laughs> by the way, I just got to say, yeah, getting clients is, is one thing. Keeping them is a whole other thing, right? Getting to 100k is one thing. Keeping it consistently is another thing. Um, and just real 100%. quick, I, I just I, I feel this is an important point, and I realize we're running a little longer than usual, but. Do you find, Carl, that when people are focused so much on, I want to make X, it's about me, 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 right? Rather than, I just really want to help these, like, the, like right now, people are struggling, depression, like everything, it's just, it's through the roof. When you take that goal outside of yourself, making those phone calls, those cold calls, you know, the ones that everyone hates, um, they become a lot easier. Yeah. Don't, it's, reframe it that you're not, Okay, we, I think we talked about this last week or maybe it was the week before, but like you're driving down the road and there is a sign for the painting company, the lawnmower, whatever it is, right? First of all, if there is somebody there painting or doing the lawn and they don't have a sign out the front, they're crazy because those signs, I don't care the worst sign in the world, just with, you know, Dave's landscaping will lead to more business, right? 100%. Uh, not a massive amount of business. This doesn't mean that they no longer have to generate leads. They just do that. But you drive by it and you're like, that sign could be so much better. That's why you phone them, right? You're looking at the newspaper, you're on Google, you're looking at a website, um, you're listening to the radio, you're, you're at a restaurant and there's a, an ad in the middle of the table, there's whatever, right? Like there's ads, like just look around guys, go online for seven minutes and the number of advertisements you're going to see will blow your mind. Okay, call them to help them. That's the difference. Don't cold call them, right? So that's why you're going to invite them to your event because you're going to go over advertising strategies that will totally change the way that that sign looks seven seconds after they walk out of the room. And you're going to go through every day. You can't, you don't have enough time to explain all of it here. This is how I would get you to the event. I don't have enough time to explain all of it here. I'll give you the fundamentals of it. Um, but you should really come because I'll, I'll frame that up for you big time. If you've got a couple of buddies that also own companies, feel free to invite them as well. I'm doing a weekly event. There's only 10 people able to be in the room because of the pandemic. Come down. Bottom line, though, that's why you make the call, right? Don't call them so you can make money because that becomes about you and you won't do it, right? A really great metaphor. 
is your kids got gymnastics on Saturday and you got to get up at 6 a.m., right? Guess what? You're up, you poop, shower, shave, ready to rock and roll, got your kid up, get them dressed, get her dressed, and you're at gymnastics five minutes early, right? Every time. And it's swimming and it's baseball and it's football and it's hockey, always. Why? Because you're doing it for them. It's your turn to wake up, go for the swim, go to the gym, go for a jog. What do you do? You roll over and hit the snooze button. The difference, one was about you and one was for somebody else. You will always do more for others than you'll ever do for yourself. So you've got to reframe the thinking um, from doing it for them, uh, or sorry, doing it for yourself and your 10 grand a month and 120 grand a year, lame goal. You do it that way. And so a different, a slightly different goal. Okay. So let's assume you don't, you're, you hate public speaking and you, you throw up at the thought of getting in front of 10 people at the chamber, right? Pick up the phone and help three business owners every single day. That's not a phone call and a message. That is a speak to three business owners, which is much more challenging than it sounds. But phone three business owners every single day and help them. That's it. What are you going to help them with? I just gave you a couple of examples. Just go and jump into your car, drive around, have your cell phone. And every time you see a sign, you see an advertisement, you see, you know, like, a, you know, the A-frame, like you're driving down the road and there's this A-frame sign. Look at it and go, you know what? I, I know how that could be. This, this could cost them a hundred bucks and make a dramatic adjustment, right? Do that. You, you get a flyer from a business. Um, I wrote an email about this. Uh, the number, um, if you Google my name and I think McDonald's or my name and five greatest McDonald's offers for sure, it'll pop up. But like, basically I wrote an email about the five best offers that McDonald's have ever, um, ever promoted. Right. And what they all, so I, I did it. And the premise like, is a long time ago, but like the premise of it is that their five best offers. And believe me, McDonald's has had some killer offers. Every one of them had one thing in common. I want you to think of what do you think is that? before I give it to you, I want you to think, what is it? Try answer it for yourself. The answer is scarcity. So every single, all the five best um, offers at McDonald's all time, all had scarcity. And then guess what? I'll speak to a business coach or a business owner and they tell me, oh, I don't like scarcity. It feels sleazy. It feels this. It feels that. I'm like, um, you're, you're, you're missing the number one attribute to the greatest offers of all time, right? <laughs> this is crazy. But then, and then I say to them, hey, so hang on. So you, you don't want to do scarcity and why? Oh, because it doesn't feel ethical. Am I right? They say, yeah. I go, okay. Just, sorry, I'm confused. I'm, you, you have coaches that work for you. They say no. I say, okay, so how many one-to-one -one coaching clients can you take on? They say 15. I say, guess what? You got scarcity. You can only take on 15 clients, right? They don't, you don't have to tell them you've got 13. You can just tell them, you know, I've got limited spots. And if you don't decide now, I'm not going to be able to accept you because you were at the room at the chamber Yesterday, there were 10 people scribbling notes. Believe me, all 10 of them want to work with me. I choose you because, because frame, we know each other. You're also a member of the chamber because Dave said you're a great guy because you know one of my other coaching clients because we know each other from the past. You give them a because frame, a reason, right? I'm choosing you because I understand your industry. I know how I can help you massively uh, because we sat together today. And I never realized we were going to be able to find all this untapped potential. That's the reason, right? If you're ripping through my software and you sat with a business owner, right? It's like profit acceleration software will literally just find all of the magic for you. But anyway, so that's the reason, right? You guess what? You got scarcity, right? So again, just so, um, how do I get off on that tangent? I can't remember, but the bottom line road dog, it's, uh, you know, this, Keep it simple, you know, keep it simple, stupid. Your brain is a very, very powerful mechanism. Um, control it. It is not trying to help you be successful. It's not going to help you try fill those events. It's not going to help you create really good goals. It's going to try and keep you safe. So you've got to grab the steering wheel metaphorically and drive that bad boy. But when you do, you, like the guy at the snow hill, the, you know, the, the power that you could have with that little head popping out of that very, you know, big machine and you won't feel it in a, you know, when he's going, he didn't feel the effects immediately. You can imagine that I'm watching going, wow, this is amazing. In his head, he's like a 
freaking, this is going to take forever, right? But steady, steady, you know, success is, success is not a game of, um, you know, best success is a game of consistency, right? So, so anyway, so that's what I'd, um, that's where I'm going to leave it today. Road dog. What do you think? But well, in fear of you going down another rabbit hole, I'm just going to tell people what your one thing is today because I'm just <laughs> Uh, what is is, it? Reach out to three business owners every day and see if you can help them. How's that? You like that one? Yes or no only, please? That's it. Shoot. High five. Thank you. Uh, there you go. You just saved right. us a rabbit hole. Woo. All right. That was a long one. So uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning into another great episode of Business Coaching Secrets. With the man on top of the hill, my boy, King Carl, if you're not on the inside getting access to the pre-show or you aren't getting Carl's daily emails, or just want more information on how to build your coaching company or on the Profit Acceleration software, visit Focus.com and subscribe today. And again, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share with a fellow coach or someone that you think might make a great coach, um, you know, the, the great uh, salesperson or highly made, uh, motivated type of individual. And of course, appreciate um, if you'd rate the episode, um, as we know, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, whatever, give an insane amount of weight towards reviews. So please leave us a review if you like what you heard. And that is it for another week. What a beauty episode. I cannot wait for next week. And remember, everybody, progress equals happiness. Take care, everybody. Carl Bryan built Profit Acceleration Software 2.0 to train business coaches how to find any small business owner more than $100,000 in 45 minutes without them spending an extra dollar on marketing or advertising. This becomes a business coach's superpower. So as a business coach, you'll never again have to worry about working with business owners that can't afford your high-end coaching fees. Check us out at Focused.com.